Despierta. ¿Sabes qué día es hoy? Vas a transformar al mundo haciendo lo que amas. Vas a cambiar las reglas del juego. Vas a mover a otros. Busca, crea, innova, vuela. El mundo te espera. Transformalo. Hazlo UPAEP. Bueno, pues muchas gracias a todos por estar aquí con nosotros. Bienvenidos a otra edición de Ideas. Eh, es siempre emocionante tener y conocer a personas que quizá no nos habían acompañado en una ponencia antes o que habían venido a compartir, entonces les agradecemos mucho el estar aquí con nosotros. Gracias. Eh, pues hoy tenemos el gusto de tener a colaboradoras, colegas aquí de eh, Departamento de Lenguas. Sí. Entonces eh, nos permitimos darles la presentación, eh, pues tal cual, ¿no? Como viene. Angelica holds a BA on Modern Languages and an MA in Teaching English at Honorum at Boat. She is currently the Director of UPAEP Languages Bachelor of Arts, Professor of English, Italian, Spanish, and uh, Content Subjects in Mexico and the U.S. She's an online facilitator of English and Spanish, CS, and CONCITEP evaluator, editor and translator of Integra 2 and researcher in the fields of ESL and CDA. And Monica Rosas holds a BA on Modern Languages and an MA in Human Development and Education. She's a full-time academy member at the UPAEP Language Department, Spanish for Foreigners Coordinator, and ESL, EFL Professor. She's also an online facilitator, academic reader, and speaker at Mex, Mextesol, and Vice President of Puebla's Mextesol Chapter. Entonces, pues aquí, apoyándonos desde su conocimiento en lidiando con alumnos de muchas diferentes culturas, muchas diferentes áreas, muchos diferentes lugares. Les agradecemos que vengan a compartir con nosotros pues estas estrategias de lidiar con esa nueva generación y no es solo lidiar, sino eh, hacer éxitos. A todos los que nos acompañan les recordamos que está por videoconferencia, entonces eh, para participar se empuja el botoncito, se pone verde la luz y al acabar su participación se empuja para apagar. Los que están por videoconferencia, recuerden que hay un texto ahí para poder seguir las instrucciones y acreditar su asistencia. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias. Ok, welcome everybody. Thanks for assisting. Today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, our research work, that is two generations, one classroom, dealing with millennial students. So, in order to start, we have in here a quote from Fishman. He says that generational character characteristics forever impact values, attitudes, lifestyles, and priorities. And I want you to pay attention to this quote and to pay attention to the next slide, okay? Do you remember some of these things? So for the ones that are in, uh, in this room, I would like you to join in pairs so we can work together, okay? And please discuss if you remember some of these things, the things that we have in here, okay? So you have like one minute or two to discuss what are the things that you remember the most. Okay, I like this slide because I saw some of you smiling, okay? So that means you remember something. I don't know if you would like to share some of the things that you that you could remember from these pictures. Some things that you remembered? Yeah. <laughs> some of the things that you remember. From, from the pictures. Yes, of course, uh, Raul Velasco, okay. Timbiriche, the Thundercats, okay. uh, the Busters, Rubik's Cube. 
Um, een serie, nou, een long play. Oké. Okay. Uh, vinyl disc. Wow. Oké, thanks a lot. But where do you remember something? I... <laughs> okay, I have to agree on that. What about what about you? Do you remember something? Yes, the films uh, Ghost and the uh, Ghoster, no? And the uh, okay, and the cartoons and cartoons. Very good. So if we remember some of these, maybe it's because we share some attitudes and values, and maybe we are from the same generation. Okay. Well, we're talking a little bit about generations, so we have in here from Strauss and Ho. Okay, they said or they mentioned that each generation has its own biography, as we just saw in the, in the picture. And in their model, generation is defined as a cohort group whose land approximates the span of, of a phase of life and whose boundaries are fixed by peer personality. So maybe we remember some things because we uh, live together, maybe not together, but in the same period of time, okay, and we share certain things. Now, we have in here certain characteristics of generations and some of the generation uh, division that authors have agreed on. Not all authors agree on which is the year in which each generation starts, and some also mentioned that we have certain uh, other divisions. But the one that almost all others agree on is this one. So we have in here the silent generation that was born from 28 to 45. Then we have the baby boomers from the 46 to the 64. Then we have the generation, the generation X from 65 to 80. And then we have millennials. Some mentioned from 81, other ones mentioned it from 91. Okay, to 96. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so, do I have to do something with this? No? Okay, just close it. Okay. So, well, I'm pretty sure that you have read about generations and probably uh, read on the internet about the characteristics that each style or, or each generation has. We're going to start working in pairs, like with your same partner, and what I want you to do is to try to guess, okay, you'll probably use the background knowledge that you have about this issue, and try to think, okay, what characteristics do you believe that are appropriate or that apply to each of the generations that we have on the worksheet? So in your worksheet, we have these three generations. We didn't include the silent generation anymore, okay, because we don't know them that much. So we're going to start here with baby boomers that would be kind of our parents, more or less, okay? This would be most of us, not all of us, okay? And finally, millennial students that would be more or less our student generation, okay? So Auntie just gave you some worksheets, and in there you have some slips of paper. In, the, in those papers, you have the characteristics that those generations should have, okay? So what I want you to do is just to discuss with the person next to you and just put them in order according to what you believe, according to what you have read about, okay? So you have like five minutes, seven minutes? Let's see if we can do this. You're super Thank <laughs> you. 
There are ten in each section. Huh? Ten for millennials, ten for generation X, and ten for baby boomers. So I guess that you have too many in the millennials. <laughs> Yeah, because there are two generations that have that as a character. Okay, so I know you didn't finish, I know, okay, but do you have most of them, some idea? So, so? Okay, let's see. What characteristics did you write in Baby Boomers, or did you put in Baby Boomers? Very busy people? Very busy people. Okay. <laughs> baby boomers? I'm not a boomer, boomer, no, 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 no. Okay, no. so not Sorry. baby people, they are Sorry. not busy people. No, 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 <laughs> focus, <laughs> focus and children. Who are the, the busy people? What about baby boomers? Let's focus. go back to the Focus, group. focus and, and okay, focus. And children and family. They focus on children and family. We put study in rhythmic and ownership. Okay. Any other back there? They appreciate a company that gives them peace of mind. Okay, company, so family, company, etc. Okay, what about Generation X? Very busy people. <laughs> okay, what else? Loyal to skills, step-by-step -step promotion. Okay, yeah. Look for quick promotion, highly competitive. Uh-huh, okay. And last one, what about the millennials that we are dealing with? <laughs> Multicultural. Multicultural. Flexible. Uh-huh, flexible. Absolutely informal. Informal, absolutely. <laughs> Not only informal, but absolutely. Te Technology goes with them, okay. Raised in a digital world, look for quick promotion. Okay. Need new experiences. Okay. So the answers to your activity are just right here. I'm sorry, I'm just going back. They are just right here, okay? So we have the millennial, they expect companies to understand the real life needs, schedule and structure life. They see themselves as part of a group. They need instant feedback and praise. They are raised in a digital world, focus on children and family, multicultural, teamwork, technology, and experienced learners. Okay, surprise? By some of them, yeah, right, I know. What, what characteristic about these type of students, students I, I'm already looking at them as students, about these type of people surprise you the most? Focus on children and family? Uh-huh, because we had put it before in another one, in Generation X, I believe, no? Any other thing that surprises you? Mm -hmm. The structure is schedule life. Uh -huh. Schedule is structured life. Okay. That is kind of surprising. Yeah. yeah. When I read it for the first time, I was like, really? But then little by little, when you see the presentation, you're going to see that, yes, that is a characteristic of this type of people. So you're going to see that. What about here in Generation X? What surprises you the most? That Generation X, it's more or less kind of our generation as we saw back with the uh, images, no? Of Thundercats and cartoons. So I think we do share that generation. Do, do you have something completely different? Yeah. Uh-huh. The, um, the need to n for new experiences all the time, I assumed, was more millennial. Okay. And the preference for working alone. Alone. Uh -huh. yes. alone. That the y two younger generations were going to be more into teamwork. Mm-hmm. Okay. Have you ever thought about the way that you like work and learn and do your stuff? Do you usually think like do you do that alone? 
Yeah, right? I think so, yeah. Like sometimes we want to believe that we are team workers, but the truth is that if we just reflect a little bit about it, we usually do stuff by yourself. Like we have this phrase, like do it by your own, no? If you really want it to be done well. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to focus on the millennial characteristics because all this presentation is about it, okay? Most of us, as we already see, are here, so we're going to try to apply these characteristics to the millennial, okay? So, I'm sorry, it's because this one has... Okay. So, the relationship between Generation X, faculty and staff, that is usually the one that is already working at universities and schools, and the millennial students who are attending higher education can be better understood on the basis of generational analysis. That one is the branch, that's the name of the field, okay, that studies this type, of, this type of characteristics. So, now that we have kind of like guess some of these characteristics, who are exactly these people? Like, who are these people who are in our classrooms and that we are dealing actually with? Well, the general millennial characteristics, okay, uh, are just here, just summarized in a little bit uh, in more detail. They are people who believe they are special. They are people who have always been sheltered. They are very confident, okay? They are team-oriented, okay, one of the surprises. They are highly achieving, like they believe they can do anything. And finally, they are very pressure people, okay? So let's see this in a little bit more detail. Special, why do we mean by special? If you think about your students, maybe your own kids, <laughs> okay, sorry, but like we usually have like this uh, attitude of celebrating everything that kids do, no? Uh, your students, I'm sure they have always been told that they were really good at doing their stuff, like they were really special people. Like even if they did something wrong, it didn't matter that much because the important thing was trying, no? Probably you remember that. So it doesn't matter that you drew really bad or that you lost or something, like you are special anyway. The good thing is that you participated in that. They are very sheltered. They have always been protected by harm, okay? And that is the one that has been the most protected in history. If you think about your childhood, probably you remember that you had some other issues and you failed and you had like things that probably the new, new people have never experienced, no? like falling from a tree or falling from a bicycle, maybe cutting uh, yourself because you were trying to cut something with the scissors or even trying to prepare something in the kitchen like a sandwich or something and you cut your finger with the knife. That has never happened with the students, millennial students, because they are not even allowed to use those things. So in this because of this reason, okay, they have this big dense structure and new regulations, okay? Now universities, schools, and all these places, they are putting new laws, and they are putting new structures for students to be protected, okay? That's the reason that we have the famous bullying now, okay? That it was not because it didn't exist in the past. Like, all of us have lived bullying in our lives, but there was not a law that says you are being a victim of bullying, okay? Or you are the one who's doing bullying, no? So we, we never experienced that before, and now we even have this regulation and things. They are very conventional and strongly attached to parents, okay? They are always in contact with them, especially with their moms, okay? And that's the reason that if your student or if one person of this characteristic has a problem, the first thing he or she's gonna do is to call mom, no? Or send a text. Mm -hmm. And then ask them, okay, mom, I have this problem, so now what do I do? And usually moms will save for life, okay? In the past, it didn't happen, no? Probably your mom didn't even pay attention to, to you in that case, or I don't know, like probably even you call them and, you, and they said like, well, it's your problem, you fix it, no? That's the way we, we were raised. So in order to like exemplify these things, we have a video, okay? This, vi this video is uh, like the woman that is talking uh, in the video, she's an author of a book. The book is that one that is going to appear in a second, and it's really interesting because it talks about all these characteristics, but let's watch. Next in the heat next, helicopter parenting. Just hearing those words gets the debate going. <laughs> one writer mom revving it up with her argument that it could be ruining a whole generation of kids. Ruining. Jesse's got that story. Hey, Jesse. Hey, George. Well, some people think that by overprotecting our children, we're raising a generation that will be underprepared for the real world. So how do you avoid that if you're a parent? Well, we've got some tips from the author of the book, How to Raise an Adult. Parenting styles can vary from too relaxed, I'm not like a regular mom, I'm a cool mom, to too protective, I'm getting rid of everything in the house that has gluten 
or sugar. To so-called helicopter parenting, where parents hover over their kids every move. But could overbearing parents be harming their kids? Kids grow up, they can't do for themselves. They don't have life skills, they don't have the skills needed in the workplace, and they have much higher rates of anxiety and depression. Julie lithcott Hames, a former dean of freshmen at Stanford University and author of How to Raise an Adult, believes parents who hover could be ruining the lives of a future generation. We parents have the best of intentions, but we're overhelping, and it leads to harm. Her claims sparking a social media debate. One woman writing, children should learn how to solve their own problems. Another defending helicopter parent saying, if a child is drowning, you're not just going to walk away. I would never tell a parent to cut your child off and just throw them into an unfamiliar place. We have to stop doing so much so that they can really begin to lead their own lives. According to Lithcott Hames, a parent herself of two teens, if you are overdoing it, there are ways to take a step back. First, stop saying we when referring to your kids. How could we lose this? I said we. Yeah, you do that sometimes. I'm so sorry. Second, stop arguing with the adults in their lives. This includes coaches and teachers. And finally, stop doing their homework for them. That our job as parents is to put ourselves out of a job. Man, here's two more tips. Parents should avoid being a concierge to their kids, making sure they get up on time, meet their deadlines, so on and so forth. And here's one the kids won't like. Have them do chores. This builds a sense of accountability, real life, and skills and work ethic. Was this field research for you? That's right. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm thinking back to what my parents would say to me. They're like, make your bed because it gives you accountability and real life work ethic skills. It's and look, true. And look at me. Yeah, and look at me. Right. Look, look, look at me now. Yeah, yeah, great example. <laughs> Shining. <That's right. laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Is it familiar? Yeah, right. Very familiar. Yes. Helicopter parenting would be protecting your children too much, like almost doing their stuff and uh, not letting them like solve, solve the, the problems that they have or they face, like in general, even like from, from I don't know, buying their clothes and even tie, making the tie to their laces and all that to like problems they have with their teachers, with their friends, etc. That would be helicopter parenting. And that is one of the characteristics, because if you remember the previous characteristics is they were special and they have always been protected from harm. So this is an example of, okay? Have you ever had an experience with that, with that kind of a student in your classroom? A lot. No, in your classroom, no? Really? Has anyone? No? Well, a student who, in the class, that, that's what I'm asking, like maybe a student who doesn't know how to even, I don't know, like open the book and find the place, or maybe just, uh, it's just making a big mess because of something a student told him, or it's like these students who are now telling you, mom, instead of teacher, like mom, she's looking at me like so wrong, like she's telling me to do these things and I don't want to. Uh -huh. So that would be an example of that, like this type of misbehave that we didn't really have in the past because they don't even see that. The other characteristic was team-oriented, okay? And these people are very collaborative in effort in general because they are always been in social situations, always, okay? They have always been connected even now, more, more, no, more now because of the technology, okay? So nowadays activities, if you think about kids, okay, like in activities uh, that are in a school, even from kindergarten or something, they are always put in groups. And probably you remember they always go together, like they don't have one best friend. Now they usually have their group of friends and they go everywhere together, you know? That would be team oriented, okay? If you think about uh, what happened just recently, now I, I don't want to talk that much about this topic of the earthquakes, but <laughs> when, uh, when the earthquake of September 19 happened, remember that many people were really celebrating their kids, okay? The millennial kids, because they could really organize themselves. And they are, they are uh, usually, they are so used to following rules and to being in groups and working together and not just like leaving all the work for one person and so. So that's one of the characteristics of these people. Like they, they are so used to collaboration that it's the way they live, exactly. The other one is confidence, okay? As we said, they were told that they could do anything in their life, okay? 
even if they were not that good at that, they were given hope, they were given motivation, like their parents were always with them. So that's the reason they always believe they can do things well, okay? And they are highly achieving, like they believe that since they are special, since they have this confidence, since they have always been helped and people have always like made their lives easier in reality, they have so many plans, you know? So they believe that life is beautiful <laughs> and everything is gonna be so easy and I can do almost anything. So the negative part would be that they are very highly pressured, okay? They are these students who usually went to school in the morning and then they were taken to ballet classes or dancing classes or I don't know, karate, taekwondo, swimming, etc. So they, they are these people who have a specific uh, like plan of activities for the week and for the weekend. No? Like the weekend always includes like going to see parents, going to do this or I don't know, like many activities that parents usually organize for their kids. So they are used to that. And they have so many things that they need a plan, but they also need somebody who tells them what to do. Like they can organize their time, but they know, oh, I mean, they need mom who takes them to school in the morning and goes and takes them back, okay? Then feeds them and then takes them to ballet and then they, they go back and then probably go to English class and then they go back and they, they do the homework. So they can, ha they can handle a lot of activities, but they need somebody who tells them what to do, okay? So that's the reason that sometimes they have very strong resumes, no? Like we have these kids who are super good in karate or they can speak two languages or so, no? Or they are very good in, in any activity besides what they want to do at a school. On top of all those characteristics, they usually have their cell phones with them all the time, okay? And for that reason, they have created this umbilical cord with their families, okay? As we said, they are very family oriented but they are always in contact with mom, with dad, with brother, sister, like with all the important people in their life, okay? So they usually don't know how to cope with all the responsibilities because then I can just call mom or dad and they solve problems as we said before. And they are very, very smart as we said, but they are very impatient because of that. They have always been given everything easily usually and they have access to lots of things that we didn't have access before, no? Even in information, probably in your classes, you have seen like these kids chatting and then uh, looking for information that you have said and checking if it was true or not, et cetera, et cetera. So that happens because now they are so used to that, okay? And they believe that they, it, it, it's just the right, like information is the right, so if nothing else is gonna happen, okay? So that would be the characteristic of these kids. So now, what happens now, okay? We have these kids that are so special, so sheltered, so et cetera. Then now they are in my classroom and I am kind of different, okay? So what do I do with them? Yeah. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the teaching strategies to work with millennials with Michael Wilson and Gerber. They develop strategies to work with them at school according to the characteristics that, that we just saw with Moni. So what are those characteristics? Taking into consideration the characteristics of the gen their generation, we have in here certain strategies that we can apply to work with them. The first one is clarify the essentials. That means when preparing assignments and evaluation, you have to be very clear on what you're asking for. I don't know if you remember, but when we were in a school, you got a seven and you got a seven and you didn't know why you got a seven. That was it. But now they have rubrics, so they know exactly what was missing or what, what was wrong with them. And also with rubrics, they, they know exactly what you are expecting from them. So they, they were raised with this new model from SEB about constructivism and so on, and also with rubrics. So they are used to that, and they are respecting that in college. Okay? So we have in here that we have to use pacing guides, and also we have parents reminding them when uh, they have to hand in assignments, on the, when they have to take exams. I have had students who have arrived with their parents to speak something with exam, or I have had parents at the first day of classes taking classes because the kid couldn't come here. And that, that happened here in the building D, okay? 
a year ago. Seriously, that happens. Okay? The next one, the next strategy, that is building significant. As we just mentioned, they were raised or they were in elementary school and junior high school when this new model about constructivism was in fashion. So they are used to that. So you need to give them possibilities to have initiative and also to be creative, okay? We have in here that the traditional phone time and a sponge, that means just you speaking and they getting information, is not going to work with them. They have to do something and they have to raise it from background knowledge. Uh, we have in here millennials need to apply their collaborative skills by designing assignments, contributing grading systems or rubric, and creating team, uh, teamwork activities. So they need this creativity in there and also this initiative to, to do certain things. The next st strategy, that is millennials and choice, okay? They were raised with a variety of choices and a variety of information, so they expect the same at college. And now that they are getting to work, also they expect the same at work, okay? What we have in here that they expect uh, to a greater array of product and service selectivity, okay? Because they have grown up with that. They, have, uh, they were raised with a lot of options, maybe at a school, to attend uh, different classes, when maybe at our school we just have like music or dance, okay? They, they had more variety, and also with activities that they had with their schedules. The next strategy, millennials and teamwork, okay? As we just mentioned, one of the characteristics of millennials is to work in teams, and they, they really like that and they like it because they actually work together. It is not like in the past that somebody was uh, in charge of the house, so you, everybody went to the house, play around the whole day, and at the end the father just did the work and you have your, your name on it. Okay, no, millennials really, really work together to get something, to work for an objective. And they, they like that because also um, they, they were raised with uh, social networking, so they are always connected with people and they like to work with them. I'm pretty sure that you remember that in the past we had um, Batman or Superman and you had to choose one, okay? Now they don't have to choose. They work in teams. We have Avengers, we have the Justice League, because that is what, what the new target audience is, is uh, what the new target audience likes. They like teams, okay? The next one. Uh, from the start, help students understand and manage stress. As Moni mentioned before, they have been raised with these busy lives and schedule activities. So also they were raised thinking that they are special and that they can achieve everything. But the truth is that they can't. So when they fail, they don't know how to manage that. They get depressed and some of the, them commit suicide and these kind of things because they don't know how to manage that. They were not used to that. They were used to win every time, okay? For example, uh, my father plays chess pretty well, and I haven't been able to win him at all in my whole life. But with my nephews and my nieces, he just let them win. It's like, oh, you beat me. I say, come on, dad, you can't do that, okay? But they were, they were raised like that, like they were special and they could achieve everything. So they don't know how to manage the stress because they haven't failed. The next one, decrease the amount of content. If you like PowerPoint, don't, don't uh, present the slides with a lot of content there because they are not used to deal with a lot of content. Try to keep it simple, 140 characters, okay? That works for them. No, but if you keep uh, a few amount of content on your slides, they, ca they can take notes because they are not used to take notes. They take pictures. And when they take pictures, they don't develop that strategy of taking notes. So if you want to push them to take notes, try to keep it simple with the things that you, that you want to highlight and you want them to, to remember, okay? So the same, they have a digital tsunami every day. They read a lot when they are just passing there, okay? But actually, if you see a post on Facebook, they just read the first line and they pass. They never go in. They, they share, but they, they don't know what they are sharing, okay? So that is, uh, they like to process information in chunks, but short. And the last one, they were raised with games, 
okay, as some of us did. Okay, so develop course elements that include actual gaming exercises. Why? Because these games low stress. So if you low stress, you can have your students more relaxed and they can use the other strategies to pay attention and at the end they can relax and you can um, adapt this. Okay? That would be the last strategy. So before going, we have another activity for you. You like to play, right? <laughs> We're going to play Kahoot. I don't know if you have play at all. Okay? But if you have play, I want you to work with your partner that you have been working with. If you have played, you know how to do it. If you haven't, please take your cell phone, okay, and go to kahoot.it, okay? So do we have Kahoot there? Could you work in Teams, you two guys? Do we have a Kahoot here? Okay, could you work together, please? And have you played Kahoot before? Okay, so let's do. Have you played Kahoot? No? Could you join them, please? Could you. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, with here. Oh, so you can join them. So we have three, three, and two. Yeah, you're a team. You're a team. You're another team. Yeah. The pin. <laughs> so we have PJ, who's PJ? Okay, we're missing another two teams. If you are watching this at home or at your work and you want to join. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you can join them. Okay, so we have millennials, you are millennials. And we're missing one. Okay, you're gonna play and you're gonna get, you're gonna play with information that Moni gave about millennials. Okay? already on the screen, okay, I don't know, I think that, yeah, that's super cool, we have another team, thank you, <laughs> so we are four teams now, cool, it's because we are, uh, we are online, exactly, okay, so we're going to start then, okay, they are questions based on the information that we have given, okay, have to be fast, six questions, ready to play. How old are the, are the millennials now? You just need to press there. Yeah. Click the Click the So, how they think? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, 30, uh, 18 to 34. Okay. Uh, no, 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 no. That's question based on the information given in the in the talk. Okay, let's see who's winning. PJ. Okay, PJ is winning now. Second one. Okay, so you're winning. Second question. What is true about the millennials? Okay, cool. And PJ is winning. Uh huh. What is not true about the millennials? What is not true? Not true. Uh huh. Not true. Good. Okay. They are highly competitive. They are not. They are not. PJ. 
Okay. <laughs> this is half of the activity, so I think he's winning, or they are winning. Millennials are. Okay, they are confident. Are they often in contact with their parents? I'm sorry, this is my, t my English teacher personality. TOEFL. No. Why, why number one is not correct? The, the green one. Aha, uh -huh. because of the often. They are not often. They are always in contact with their families. Always, always, always. Uh -huh. Tricky question. TOEFL I question. Okay, PJ. Question five. We have six questions. Millennials. Okay, cool. They need a structure and flexibility. Somebody's winning. <laughs> and what is not what is not an effective academic strategy for millennials? <laughs> Yeah, keep because if you know the answer, it's timing. Now it's timing. Okay. So, PJ team winning. Number one. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, and this is cool because then you are paying lots of attention. Okay. So now that we already mentioned the characteristics and Angie already mentioned the strategies that we should use with them. Okay. Now, how do I plan my class? Okay, to take into consideration the characteristic and the strategies. Okay, and <laughs> okay. So, how do we do it? Taking into consideration millennials' characteristics and the strategies, we develop a plan to apply them in class, and it worked. Okay, so this is what we have. Taking these considerations is actually successful. Okay, the first one, try to change activity every seven minutes. That is for the attention span. They don't have a, a long attention span, so you have to change activity. I know that you're going to think that it's too much, but it's not. Actually, that we, the things that we have been doing is this. Okay, we start with the picture, then we watch the video, then you work with the worksheet, then we have the game. So we have been changing all the time. And that is to keep you, like, focused, okay? So try to, it's not like I'm wait, waiting, like, seven minutes, I have to change. No, but you have to more or less calculate, okay? The second one, try to use worksheets and in teams, okay? We have a, we have a lot of uh, PowerPoint and digital material that we like to apply on classes. But also we have this uh, dark classroom syndrome that you pass around the university and everything is dark because we have PowerPoint presentations. So try to turn on the light and have them to work with their hands, okay? That, that also works because they, they have, uh, I don't know, they have had classes in the darkness for three hours. So maybe if you are the one lighting the lights on, they are going to pay attention to you, okay? The second one, reduce the content in your PowerPoint, okay? Try to reduce it. Try to use big uh, fonts and also colors, okay? So you, you have like the attention, okay? The next one, uh, interactive choice homework, okay? Maybe if you want them, for example, to read, don't ask them for a report. Just ask them for evidence that they read. So maybe some gave you a report, maybe some gave you a mind map, maybe another one's brainstorming, maybe another one's give you the, the, the highlighting thing, but that's the purpose, they read. So if you have them to choose something, they do it better, okay? The next one, gaming, because this reduces stress. And also, if you play, they can use their notes that they usually don't take, okay? So this is like the plus. And also, you can check if the, if the content was um, successfully delivered in their brains, okay? So the last one is like if you have gaming, Kahoot is an example, but there are many other strategies or games that you can apply. But if you have them to use their cell phone, they feel like they, they don't feel anxious because they have touched them in class. Okay? So, 
Actually, we applied these strategies in class. This was applied not in English the first time. It was applied on a content class. It was Morphologia del Español. Okay, so everybody can apply it. Okay, and this is these are the results from this class. So we have interactive choice homework. Tuviste libertad de elegir la forma de entregar tus evidencias de lectura. Te ayudó? Okay, 85% said yes. And actually, I have the works in there, and I have like pretty good mind maps, like huge. And I usually don't ask them for that because I don't like them, so I prefer the report. But I I get I got like full reports. But with this choice, I got better um, homework. The next one. Uh, las tareas tenían como propósito socializar con la comunidad UPAE, trabajar en equipo, al mismo tiempo que aprendías e investigabas más acerca de tu tema. ¿Te ayudó? The same. 85% said that mucho. ¿Ok? ¿Ok? So, yeah, me da igual. Eso. Ok. <laughs> and they are honest. ¿Ok? <laughs> so, if they have to socialize and to meet new people and to work together, they like that. ¿Ok? The next one. Change activity every seven minutes. Attention span. Tu profesora planeó las actividades de clase tomando en cuenta el tiempo de atención a las mismas, con el propósito de mantenerte enfocado y que no te distrajeras. Cumplió su objetivo, explica por qué. ¿Ok? So, almost everybody said yes. ¿Ok? So, and actually, I, you, you can see that. You know when they are texting or watching something, and you're like, ok, I love them. ¿Ok? But with this one, they were like compromised to the class, so if you apply this, like, It's not like exactly, exactly seven minutes, but if you try to use it, you can keep their attention. The next one, reduce content in PowerPoints. Okay, en comparación con otras materias, ¿qué tanto tomaste notas en la clase de Morpho? 92%. Okay, those are pictures from their notebooks. I never asked them for a notebook. I never asked them to take notes. I just asked them at the end to take the pictures. And everybody took notes, and everybody took like pretty good notes. They use the notes, the notes because we play at the end of the class, so they need the information. So if you want them to take notes, this is a good strategy. Those were the comments from the class. Okay, all of them were like pretty good. And actually, if you would like to know, my evaluation docente got pretty high. Okay, <laughs> so that's a plus. Okay. We have in here some of the the classes. Uh, this this was the class. So this is where, where they were playing Kahoot, okay? And this was a project, was a homework to create a song about articulos, adjetivos, and so on, so they can plagiarize that, okay? And it worked a lot. And now the surprising stuff, okay? I have in here rate the activities according to their effectiveness in your learning. I asked them what was like the most uh, successful strategy for them. This was the first, teamwork. I was pretty surprised. I didn't expect that as first. The second one is between the green one, that is worksheets, and the Kahoot. So they like the worksheets. Some of them actually wrote it as the most, okay? They like to be with lights, working with their hands, doing something different than just the screen. The third one, also surprising, was the PowerPoint. Okay? They got pretty uh, reduced amount of content, so they were friendly to watch, not to see. And then we have the uh, next one is, okay, Kahoot is right bit in between, they like to play. And I also gave them like prizes, like one tenth for the partial, that is like nothing but they, they, they feel it's like a lot, so they, they did a pretty good job, okay? Don't, don't say that to them, okay? <laughs> and the last one, they don't like videos. They don't like them. They are used to that. Maybe we like them because we had this overhead projector, do you remember that? Without color, so we like videos, but they don't like them a lot. I think that is because they have seen that in their cell phones and they are used to that, so it's not attractive for them. I, I use them to change the activity like every seven minutes because they are pretty good videos. But also if you use videos, try to use them short. Okay, don't use a lot because they, they really don't like them. Okay? So, a final note for further research. Okay, we are still working on ethics with plagiarism. They, they, they don't actually know what that is. They don't know what that means. 
they have the information in their cell phone and they are used to use whatever they, they want without quoting. So we are still working on that. The only thing that we can say about it is that if you ask them for something very creative that is not online, they have to work and then you avoid that. But if you ask for a report, it's pretty difficult because you have to explain what plagiarism is. They, they really don't, don't understand that, don't, don't comprehend what that is. So we're still working on that, but if you have any suggestion, we're welcome to hear that. Okay? So we hope you like them. Okay? May the force be with you. <laughs> I don't know if you have any questions, any suggestions. Thank you. Question? Okay. Well, thank you very much for that conference. It was fun and interesting. It's also good to see some of the things we've been doing for years um, really have some validity down at the undergrad. I have almost no contact with undergrads. Yeah. So when you were asking earlier if I experienced a lot of this in the classroom, it's uh, no. I, t I tend to have older graduate students yeah. that are choosing an engineering graduate career because they want it. So they're going to struggle and fight through whatever they have to. But I do have limited contact. And um, teamwork has been the number one skill that they need to build all along. It's the only thing that I've seen really get them through difficult projects. This was like teaching a physics class, and people often don't think of, you know, teamwork and physics. So I give them a semester-long project. They choose the project. Yeah. They choose the topic. They choose. I just give them, you know, I need three physics concepts and a project you can demonstrate or film. You know, and then off they go. And uh, the other one has been to give them choice, like you said, in everything. I, I give you optional homework you can do for extra points and optional things that you can do for other things. And the short PowerPoint, I think that's just a universal. I mean, 15 years ago when I was uh, in getting some lessons on lecturing, the person teaching us was telling us to never put more than 7 to 15 words, new words, up yep. on a screen at a time. That is just distracting. It's too much, you know, and you shouldn't have your entire speech up on the screen. Yeah. But the other thing that I've done is I've changed. I don't do this for the graduate school. Cause I just do projects instead of exams. Um, I'm crucifying me somewhere. But for undergrads, I change the exams. So I give them to inspire them to take notes. Half of the exam is closed books, closed notes, closed everything. Because it's just I want you to remember the basic concepts from the course, things you should be able to know if anybody asks you. And then for the second half of the exam, they're allowed to use all of their notes because it's going to be more complicated yeah. problems. More so their notes are exquisite. <laughs> you know, and uh, they rarely use them because it's the process of making the notes really made the, you know, really made the subject matter stick. So it's fun to see this kind of stuff uh, develop. I really hope that we can get away from a lot of the bad habits that we've been dealing, especially with uh, SEP-related choices <laughs> at the elementary level. And congratulations on, on your work. Thank you. Generally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Although teamwork tends to work well with the very difficult classes. So when I've had like advanced math modeling, I'll put them in little groups of two or three to build a demonstration project of one of the really complicated topics. And they usually really, I, I think teamwork and engineering has been kind of like a cornerstone for years. I don't know, 20 years, 30 years, but probably in other in other disciplines, flipping the script would be very good.
Back there, and okay. Yeah. Uh, well, we um, I consider not all. We must uh, measure that about the um, they all of them because I consider you are um, assumed that all millennials, all millennials. Well, we must say. Uh, uh, um, Almost all, but not all. Okay. Almost all, not all. Well, okay. I consider. Also, uh, I wonder if this kind of behavior, as you you conceive the millennials, because I consider you have a special conception of millennials. Yeah. Uh, it depends of econ economical status to be like them. No. Because, for example, well, for me. Um, it's different. I consider it's different when you uh, when you have a, a different socioeconomical status. I consider it's different. You have different opportunities in life when you have money or when you have, uh, for example, if you are in this institution in, at Upayop, it's different if you are uh, uh, at um, um, public, pub public school. It's different. No, it's not. And actually, for example, with the Generation X and the Millennials in Mexico, some authors said that maybe Mexico started a little bit later because we had the digital era after the U.S. But still, we are at, at least I am Generation X. And it doesn't matter I went to a public school and it doesn't matter anything. I, I share the characteristics of the same generation because it's a long period of time and all the events affect that. For example, the baby boomers are affected by the World War and there's no matter where you live, you were affected by that in either or other way. So there's, there are, there are going to be variations of the, on the characteristics according to the level, to the place and so on, but still you are a millennial and still you are a Gen X and still you are a baby boomer because you were raised with those things and you inherit another things from the previous generation. So it's not a matter like, you cannot be like so, um, there's flexibility, but there is also this generational analysis that takes into consideration a long period of time because everything affects you. Like, for example, now we're going to be affected, I'm pretty sure, by earthquakes. And that's going to change something in our behavior, and that's going to change something in society, and maybe next generations are going to be aware of that, or they are going to be raised different as people in Mexico City after the 85. So there are many things affecting generational changes. It's not just public, private, or economical status, it's like everything. And either way, you are affected by that. Yeah. Yeah. Probably the one that had like a big problem with dogs was, I don't know, your great grandma. And that's the reason that she got so scared, so she told your, your grandma not to be with dogs. And that's the reason that your family never had dogs. And then the other person, like, just stay with that contact. And they always said, well, you should be scared of dogs, like, you should never get close to them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's the reason you get that, like, inheritance. Uh huh, that fear for, for something that you never lived. 
it's the same situation as what Angie was saying. Like it, it's something that all generations, all people share, or even if they they have not been faced with the same situation. Mm -hmm. The first time, the first time it was, uh -huh. we are applying that at the DELC with English classes, Spanish classes, and uh, I think that Josue, who was here, he wants to also include the German department. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you want to join, that would be super good because then we can do something like inside the school, and we can probably do some other stuff like with different disciplines to check also how it works. No, uh -huh. Like teachers teach usually the way they learn, and that's usually what we believe it's gonna work, but people are different, and generations are different. Even like, I don't know, like people in general are different. You cannot really assume that all the people are gonna work making, uh, I don't know, summaries, because you are super good at making summaries and you enjoy reading the summaries. As, as Angie mentioned before, probably other student prefers like, uh, I don't know, a, a student who is more visual, he prefers to do mind maps, but we just don't, like I just really hate my math. <laughs> so, exactly, like that's the worst thing that you can ask me to do. But there are some students who really like it and it depends on the generation and it also depends on the personality. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we are reducing teamwork, we are taking into consideration the characteristic that your, let's say like your, your client, <laughs> that would be the student, uh, requires. So in this case, it's for millennials, but if you have a, that's the reason I was telling the professor there, like if you have another type of uh, class where your students are different, then you have to switch. The point here is that you should be flexible to change all these characteristics and all these strategies to fit what works the best with the public that you have, like with your audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah? We do at DELT because we work a lot, a lot in, in teams because almost all classes are to learn the language, so they have to speak to other person. So they are allowed to choose their team. So it's like, I, I don't mind if you would like to work with your best friend or with the person next to you, but you have to work with somebody. And actually, the results are pretty good. So I have had a class. It was a nursing class. I had the boyfriend, the girlfriend, and the ex-girlfriend. <laughs> See, it's true. Okay? They work together. So I asked them to work together. It's like, okay, it's a language class. You have to speak to each other. So I'm so sorry. Okay? You have to work the three of you because if I separate you, you're going to kill each other. So they, they did. And that's the worst situation I have ever had in my life, working with a class. It was like, seriously, the top of it. But they work together, and at the end, it worked not as well as if they would have a good relationship, but it worked. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's true. It's a, a fact. <laughs> First of all, congratulations. It was a, a, a great uh, paper. 
to to show here at IDEAS. And I want to, to, to ask you something. Here at, at graduate school, we have in class all generations in Clave. Mm -hmm. So do, do you think that, that the things that work for millennials work for every generation? Not all of them, because there are there are certain things that are pretty like like the stamp of each generation. So, for example, as Moni said, uh, mind maps and this kind of thing is like for new generations. I also hate mind maps. I don't like them. It's the same. It's like we we are taking a diplomado and we have to make a mind map. It's like oh, come on. And it was not so hard, but it's like I don't like it. Yeah. Yeah, and also, for example, uh, millennials enjoy working in teams. Gen X doesn't like like it a lot. So maybe if you if you have like a class with different type of generation, that is pretty rich because you can work with different strategies every single time, and it's gonna work because somebody's gonna like it. The problem is like when you have a lot the same generation and they get bored. That is because you are doing something wrong, okay? And actually, that's what happened here. We were, we have been teaching from I don't know, like 16 years, and there was a period in which you see that your activities, your strategies were not working anymore. So it was like, who's changing? I'm not changing, okay? So they are changing, so I have to change in order to to get them a better, uh, I don't know, learning experience in the class. So yeah. 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 And I really think one of the things that uh, this whole conversation and your research challenges us to do is the thing that I find us most uncomfortable doing, especially in, in Mexico being flexible, changing, and evolving in our teaching strategies. Worst of all, I think, is the fact that we think we have to have a set and specific yeah. you know, group of strategies. You know, I'm going to do exactly this and this way and every time, and this always works. And we're being challenged to evolve to change. because, good God, nothing makes me sicker than seeing, like, uh, <laughs> Pedagogia instructions about oh, <laughs> 77,000 things we need to do exactly this way. Uh, I don't think it's ever worked, but I really think it doesn't work for this generation. And it, it's, it challenges us as teachers, and more than anything, it should challenge us as designers of new programs, redesign of curriculum, uh, directors of the programs that are encouraging our own professors to do different things. It's got to challenge us to also be leaders in demonstrating this change. You know, we're going to ask our students to do something uncomfortable, possibly something they're going to have to learn and push. I have to be willing to also break out of my comfort zone in order to bring the best kind of, you know, learning experience to them. That, after all, that that's the whole point. I want them to be better than me at everything I've ever done. You know, that's we want a generation that's better than us, and we want progress and growth. So this this is a good challenge. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, and actually just to add, uh, adding something to that, last Friday that we had the chance to be with uh, President of FIMPES, President of ANUYES, and um, who else was there? Um, Secretary General de, Secretary Nacional de Educación Superior, almost, not almost, all of them talk about flexibility because now the world is just changing so fast that they mentioned when you start the major, maybe when you end the major, the things that you learned before are not going to be working anymore. So we need this flexibility, as you mentioned, everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Despierta. ¿Sabes qué día es hoy? Vas a transformar al mundo haciendo lo que amas. Vas a cambiar las reglas del juego. Vas a mover a otros. Busca, crea, innova, vuela. El mundo te espera. Transformar. Hazlo, UPA. 